since we're setting up static routes, let's now give our static route, our default route, going this way for R1. So what we'll do is it's also a serial 0 slash 0 slash 0 interface. Let's just double check. So we'll do that really quickly on R1. So on R1, we get to global configuration mode and IP route and there is our static route for R1. All right, so that's done. All right, so now comes the fun part. Now we get to configure OSPF on these routers and start playing with OSPF. Now, what I want to do is is I want to purposely start by configuring OSPF on the router down here R2 first. Now, the way OSPF works is the first router that's configured oftentimes becomes the DR, right? And so I'm going to pull this summary route information down now and pull this DR election process up here. And we'll talk a little bit about that. And another thing I want to address is why do we have a DR, BDR election anyway? Why do we need a designated router and a backup designated router in OSPF? Well, the way link state protocols work is link state protocols, a link state router, right? or a router running a link state routing protocol is going to send link state updates and link state information to all other routers in the network, right? So that means that this router is going to send its link states to all these routers, and then this router is going to send its link states to all these routers, and so on and so forth. Now, in a multi-access network, right, where we have um, uh, multiple routers on the same network, that's a lot of link state packets going back and forth and it's going to suck up a lot of bandwidth and it's going to make the routers work harder than they need to right so you know r3 sending all of its packets to r1 r0 and r2 and an r2 sending all of its link states so in a multi-axis network a dr bdr election what happens is the routers will send their link state packets to the dr and then the dr will disseminate them to the other routers and then the BDR is waiting as a backup. So if the DR goes down, then let's say the BDR takes over, and then everybody will be sending their link state packets to the new DR, and then that DR will disseminate the link state packets to all the other routers. So it's kind of like having, when there's multiple routers in a multi-access network, it's a way of disseminating the link state packets so that everybody doesn't have to send to everybody else. So, and then the question becomes, and this is important in the CCNA, Cisco CCNA, is, well, how do you elect a DR and a BDR? Well, it's, um, there's a pecking order. So if you set the router priority number, the router with the highest router priority number will become the DR, and then the uh, router with the second highest priority number will become the BDR, and so on and so forth, okay? But the router priority number is not configured by default. So you'd have to configure that. So I have that listed here as number one. And then the second way that a DR and a BDR election takes place is with the highest router ID number. Now, if you don't do anything at all, then this bottom line will take over. This one right here, I'll say C, will take over. And what that is, it'll be the router with simply the highest IP address on any of its interfaces. So, um, and then the router with the second highest IP address will be the BDR. So R2 here has a 50.2 um, interface and a 2.0 interface, or a 2.1 interface, because it's 2.1. So the 192.168.50.2 is higher than the 2.1, but this one has a 50.3 interface. So this router has a higher interface than R2. Uh, the 3.1 is lower. And then this router, R0, this is the router that we want to be the DR. You can see that we've configured it with a 50.10 address. And 50.10 is higher than 50.3, it's higher than 50.2, it's higher than 50.1. And it's higher than 3.1, 0 0.1, and all that rat jazz. So that would be a way that we could influence by setting the highest IP address on R0 to be the DR. But there's a problem. Even though R1 has a 50.1 address and a 1.1 address here, it also has this interface going to the ISP router, which is 200.10.10.253. Right, the 252 network 
and it's 253. Well, this 200.10.10 network, 200.10.10.252 uh, network, uh, is a higher interface than any of these routers, right? These are all 192.168s. So if you want to go by, if you don't do anything at all, if we don't configure any special configurations, by highest IP address, R1 would win if all of these routers started at the same time, <laughs> which never happens. Um, so uh, another way you could influence this process is by bypassing just the highest interface IP address and configuring a loopback interface on these routers. And if the loopback interface is configured on any one of these routers, then the loopback interface will be the uh, winner. So the highest IP address on loopback interface trumps highest interface IP address. And then also what you could do is you could simply set the router ID number by just manually configuring it and it could show you how to do that. So you could say I want to configure the router ID number on R0 now because this guy's got this high IP address right here so I could set the router ID number on this R0 to 222.222.222.222 and then that router ID number will um, be the highest uh, will will win if all of the routers were to start up at the same time okay but they don't and that's the other caveat is that the DR is usually the router that starts up first and then the router that starts up second will be the BDR and then those never change until the router is restarted the router is reloaded um, an interface goes down or you could clear the IP OSPF process so you could run that command that would clear the OSPF processes and kind of start them over and then uh, that's another way that you can influence the DR BDR election so let's start configuring OSPF and take a look at it okay so I'm going to start with R2 here so we'll click on R2 and we'll hit enter and enable and conf t and we're going to type in router OSPF and then the process ID which will be in this case 1 and there we just started OSPF. Now OSPF needs networks to function with so we'll say network these are the networks that are going to participate that OSPF is going to hand out so it's got the 192.168 and this is router 2 so it's the 2.0 network and then the opposite of the subnet mask is the wildcard bits so in this case it's 0 .0 .0 0 0.0.0.255 well why is that normally it would be slash 24 subnet mask 255 255 255 and the inverse of that is the 255's become zeros and the zero becomes a 255 and you have your wildcard bits it's essentially the inverse and then area zero okay and there's our first network that's going to participate in OSPF. It's going to be the 2 network, which is the LAN right here, this LAN right here. Now we got to do this network. So this network is the 50 network, so I'm simply just going to up arrow and then change that. And now we have two networks participating in OSPF. Now, I don't need to send OSPF information out of this interface to the hosts on this LAN. So I need to, to make this interface passive so that it doesn't send OSPF link state packets out to all the clients. It's okay to send them this way, just we don't need to send them this way. So what we're going to do is, I'm going to put a question mark here and look for the passive interface command. And there it is. So I put a question mark and you can see here I've got some choices here. There's passive interface. So I'll type PAS tab passive interface and then a question mark and it wants fast ethernet okay so f f a 0 slash 1 can we do that yes we can so we hit end and now that's configured so OSPF is now functioning on this router and passive interface we're not sending link state packets this way for R3 we'll do the same thing we'll say enable and conf t for configure terminal router OSPF1 network 192.168 I'll do the 50 network this time first 50.0 then the wildcard bits 
Once again, the wildcard bits are the opposite of a subnet mask. And then area 0, the single area OSPF area that we're working with here. In this case, it's area 0. I'll hit, I'll hit enter, and then I have a misspelling here, so I'll fix that. Typo. Okay, that worked. And now I need to also put in, this is router 3, so we need to also add the 3 network. So I put in network 192.168.3.0, wildcard bit 0.0.0.255, and then area 0, and we're done. Now, I also want to put in the passive interface command, tab completion, FA 0 slash 1, because I don't want to send link state packets out to the LAN. Type end, and this is done. Now, we can also see what happened with the DR BDR elections. So we'll say show IP OSPF neighbor to see our OSPF neighbor, and we have um, achieved an adjacency. You can see here this output that came to the window automatically that said OSPF adjacency change process one and then here when we put in the show IP OSPF neighbor command we can see 50.2 is our neighbor we can see that it's full adjacency so the uh, state is full and you can see that it is the DR so 50.2 became the DR even though this router has the 50.3 IP address it has the highest IP address between the two but it is not the DR because R2 was configured first so um, so there you have it so it matters which router is configured first